but I just want to make full credit. So I think we'll go ahead and get started. We might have a couple of people filter in, but I want to keep the time on a Friday. I know we all have lots of places to be. Uh, so, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Matthew King, who is an Associate Professor of Transnational Buddhism at the University of California at Riverside, um, and he, where he also serves as the Director of Asian Studies. He's on sabbatical, working on his new project. Um, his research in the social history of knowledge along the Tibetan-Mongol interface during the late and post-imperial periods has been funded by the Mellon Foundation, the Henry Luce Foundation, the ACLS, and the Social Science Research Council, to name a few. His first book, Ocean of Milk, Ocean of Blood, A Mongolian Monk in the Ruins of the Qing Empire, published in 2019 by Columbia University Press, earned awards from the Central Eurasian Studies Society, the American Academy of Religion, and the International Convention of Asian Scholars, of Asia Scholars. We are here today to discuss his second book, In the Forest of the Blind, The Eurasian Journey of Fa Shan's Record of Buddhist Kingdoms, published by Columbia University Press in 2022. So thank you so much on behalf of the Center for East Asian Studies, Center for Buddhist Studies, and uh, Department of Religious Studies. Anybody else I'm leaving out? We have a fourth. The Department of Religious Studies. The Department of Asian Studies. Awesome, right? So thank you. Welcome. <laughs> well, thank you uh, very much, Professor Sashiro, and for everyone else uh, here for the hospitality and the chance to come uh, not only talk about this book, but also yesterday I had a chance to meet some students in religious studies, capstone students, and I'm looking forward to meeting some of the graduate students uh, uh, today as well. It's really fun to get to meet some students uh, after being on sabbatical for a while. Um, okay, so let me just, I'm going to read off the paper so I stick to time, but there'll be lots of chances to have some conversations, and I have some slides up here which I hope will be of an interest to students who may be thinking a little bit outside of Inner Asia, um, but who I think will be interested in some of the ways that knowledge was circulating and being mapped and worked out uh, uh, in this project. So, uh, critiques of Orientalism and reckoning with colonial legacies in the human sciences are hardly new, yet to date surprisingly few studies have tracked the perception of Orientalist texts and knowledge practices as these were exchanged and remade uh, outside of the North Atlantic, into and out of imperial formations, into and out of the epistemic sovereignty claimed by the West, and into and out of non-European and non-colonial frames. My book, um, that I'll be discussing, uh, is an attempt to experiment with the doing of this kind of history for Buddhist studies and the critical Asian humanities, working across Chinese, French, Manchu, Mongolian, and Tibetan frames of references. The specific circulatory history I explore in this book fo uh, focuses on interconnected projects across 19th and 20th century Eurasia to make sense of the ancient walking and witnessing of a 5th century monk named Fasha, who I'm sure many of you are familiar with. This was a centerless exchange that made and unmade an entire humanist subfield in France, but which also made and unmade historical knowledge in the Qing Empire, and made and unmade models of world historical order among Siberian, Mongolian, and Tibetan Buddhist monks and scholars who, in time, were weathering the violence of the revolutionary modern in Asia's heartland. And this afternoon, I'll introduce a little about this dispersed history of field creation that I discovered in the course of writing this book was simultaneously also a history of field erasure, a history that decenters the universalism and placelessness of the West then and today, a history which implicates us, actually, in contexts like this, as much as Fashan and Inner Asian monks and French natural philosophers into a, similar, a single field of inquiry and critical reflection. Uh, okay, oops, back. So let me begin today, uh, as I do in my book. It's the spring of 1830 at the Institut de France in Paris, where a much anticipated lecture is about to begin. It's like my movie trailer. <laughs> <laughs> let's, go, let's go back to Paris. Here we are. Okay. The savants of Paris whispered excitedly as they took their seats facing the empty podium. The speaker waiting to take the lectern was Jean-Pierre Abelard Moussat, 
Just 42 years old, he was considered already a master of the Orientalist's interpretive art. Those who gathered knew him as, quote, the first Sinologist in France, even in Europe in the modern sense of the term. But by 1830, the time of this lecture, Abafé Moussa had distinguished himself for much more than Sinology. In the language of fact and event, for decades he had pioneered scholarly practices to discipline Buddhism, Buddha and Buddhists, or the Buddhists, as objects of history, capital H history, geography, capital G, geography and philosophy. Paris was, in the early 19th century, the hub of systematic Orientalism in Europe, and at the center of its science of Buddhist Asia, or Science de l'Orient Bouddhiste, was Jean-Pierre Abertin Mousset, its first master practitioner. And in forums like the Proceedings of the Société Asiatique, one of the very early uh, Asian studies kind of associations in, in the West, or in the pages of the Journal Asiatique, both of which he had founded in 1822, Abaché Mousset had for decades mapped Buddhist Asia as a, continent, a new continent of possibility for Europe. Without any precise physical location, Buddhist Asia was not, it, its geography was not of the media of earth or water. The Buddhist Asia which had been disciplined in Abaché Mousset's scholarship was not any particular place but an abstracted field of association among places. From this newly imagined relational content, Abafé Mousset's disciplinary practices extracted previously unknown moral and metaphysical resources for the project of becoming modern in Europe. Controversially, among his critics, Abafé Mousset surveyed Buddhist Asia, Asia's slopes and spires not exclusively from Indian sources, in his field-building scholarship in France, or kind of centered in France, Buddhist Asia wound across Central, Inner, and East Asian scripts and texts, many of them previously unstudied in Europe, prior to his work and those of his colleagues. Out of the, and I'm using the language of the time, the primitive ether of the non-West, about that ill-defined and desire-saturated object of 18th century Orientalist, or, Orientalist knowledge, Abhé Mousset's rigorous models and methods had set nations like Cambodia, Tibet, Java, Japan into new analytical relationship. Across their differences, they now appeared as sharing some deeply historical set of disciplines, ideas, and moral orders. Buddhism, right? Buddhist Asia. Buddhism, on this scholar's mosaic-like view, was spread across Chinese sources as much as Sanskrit ones. The biography of the Buddha, which Abhé Mousset in his milieu had first presented to Europe, unfurled in Mongolian as much as in Pali. And while the philosophy of what he called the religion Samanen, the sort of Shramanera religion of India, um, had surely originated in South Asia, and in fact Abhé Mousset himself had proven that the Buddha had been a man, a historical figure, that he had lived in India, and that he was not some avatar of Mercury, a meandering Egyptian, or an Ethiopian. These were all the dominant theories in Europe in the late 18th and early 19th century of who the Buddha may have been. Abhé Mousset had proven that the Buddha, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Abhé Mousset had shown that the doctrinal substance of Buddhism could be illuminated only by rigorous comparison of interacting and connected ideas, histories, and literatures across Asia. So we take this for granted in the Buddhist study center in our classrooms. But Abhé Mousset in his milieu, in the context of the European sort of disciplinary history that begins this story, um, this was really a new project and a controversial one. Many of those gathered, remember we're still in Paris, right? Many of those gathered in the lecture hall considered Abhé Mousset a genius, a luminary who had established the scientific field single-handedly. In public writing and oration about him from the 1810s to the 1840s, he was often ranked next to Newton or Pascal, as the individual wellspring of an entire field of science. The closer examination of his published works, his letters, and so on, reveals his debts. And it's important for my project to understand the context in which he made a science of Buddhist Asia, as much as it was as, uh, important to understand the context in which his science was erased uh, in trans-Eurasian circulation. So let me just talk about how uh, his context, and we'll talk about um, how this was uh, basically uh, refused. So, his deaths, uh, of his science of Buddhist Asia. The first reservoir of practices from which Abhé Mousset disciplined Buddhist Asia was a classical, 
oh, sorry, uh, classical, um, biblically derived philology that was very familiar and common across, you know, right up to the 18th and the early 19th century in Western Europe, um, which Abel Moussa himself had uh, had mastered. Um, uh, it was uh, it, the second, though, and this is very much of his times and the context in which a thea, an idea like Buddhist Asia and a professional scholarship devoted to its study emerges, comes from uh, the new systematic Orientalism promoted by Abelkin Mousset's mentor, Antoine Isaac Sabesto de Sassy. Um, uh, I should say also, this is the context in which like the Rosetta Stone is being deciphered. I mean, it's just this flurry of sort of Orientalist philology and interpretation happening in this immediate milieu around Sassi and uh, about and so on. Uh, it was Sylvester de Sassi's mem uh, uh, under his mentorship that Abel Moussaint had first undertaken self-study of Chinese and Manchu. In time, not only could he read Chinese and what was being called Tartar, which was Manchu, Mongolian, Uyghur, and Tibetan, but he also offered Europe their first systematic grammars of all these languages. And for this, he was appointed, under Sassi's mentorship, to the Collège de France as the world's first research chair in the languages and literatures, not just of China, but of Tartary Manchu. Right? However, Abelkin Mousset's disciplining of Buddhist Asia has two other distant and rarely acknowledged sources which were really important for my book. Um, it became, <coughs> um, and I, yeah, I needed to take these into account, especially since they are, are so rarely acknowledged methodological precursors to what we now call Buddhist and Asian studies. The first was a pre-Darwinian model of racialized and nationalized descent derived explicitly from the great German philosopher and mathematician uh, Leibniz. So at least in my training in Asian studies and Buddhist studies and in religious studies, you know, we started with Marx, maybe some Schopenhauer, Weber, Durkheim, we weren't going to Leibniz. But in my work in, in this book with Abbas, and we said in his milieu, literally these first people applying the name of something called Buddhist Asia, this continent of relation, they are doing so in direct relationship to Leibniz uh, in ways that are interesting. I'll, I'll talk about a little bit. Leibniz's project on universal characteristics, which understood all diversity as mirrored and relational, proposed that all difference could be translated into a single grammar. And it was an explicit reference to Leibniz that in 1810, uh, between 1810 and 1830, Abdelkin Mousset and his closest colleagues in France, also in Russia, um, uh, invented Buddhist Asia as a vast continent of similitude overlaid by only a superficial difference. So this is this project, right? If you can read Chinese, if you can read Japanese, and Korean, and Manchu, and Pali, and even Arabic, and even uh, you know, Syriac, and so on and so forth, you can, what emerges is a unified, systematic, trans-historical, translingual uh, um, body of ideas, and history, and, and civilization, something called Buddhism, right? This, is, this, this was this idea. In mosaic of scripts, peoples, and ideas masked, uh, sorry, it's the mosaic of scripts, peoples, and ideas masked vast networks of relation, interaction, and mobility. And so the objects of history, of philosophy, and of geography were to be made by finding and translating mirrored language and concepts, and this is the language he used, in such idioms as Chinese, Sanskrit, Manchu, Tibetan, Burmese, and so on, as I say. Now, what is also important, the other methodological, so methodological, not just intellectual, methodological, Wellspring for Abdelkhim Moussa's Science of Buddhist Asia, one which is largely hidden ex from explicit, being referenced explicitly in his writing, but which I uncover in my book, uh, especially from archives at the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris, which has all of Abdelkhim Moussa's writing and letters and so on and so forth. The other methodological wellspring for the science of Buddhist Asia, the very idea of Buddhist Asia, were polylingual reference works produced in the contemporary Qing Empire. In about him was time, this was contemporary. It's not China, right? It's the Qing, the Pauline world. As many of you will know, of course, the sovereignty of the Manchu ruling elite and the sort of Qing imperial project generally, though never consensual and always in flux, was founded in different ways in overlapping models of Han, Manchu, Mongolian, Tibetan, and Uyghur ethnicity language, religion, history, territory, and right to rule, of course. 
the Qing is so famous for projecting multiple idioms of sovereignty and legitimacy and authenticity and, and so on at different parts at different times. Many dictionaries, vocabularies, and other translation tools published in the courts of Kanxi and Qian, uh, Qianlong emperors and so on in the 18th century had been collected by French envoys and deposited upon shelves at the Bibliothèque Royale in Paris, where Albert Mousset was appointed in 1824 as conservator. In the archives of the Collège de France, though, I discovered as early as 1810s that Abdelhamid Mousset, before he was even a professor, poached a comprehensive view of the form, languages, organizing concepts, and equivalencies of Buddhist Asia directly from Qing encyclopedias and translation guides. So this is Abdelhamid Mousset's handwriting as a student, as a student, as a, a medical student in the 18, uh, around 1810, 18, and he was barred from actually acting. Of course, missionaries, European missionaries have been in the courts of the Qing and the Ming, of course, for a long time, right? There were Latin Chinese dictionaries and even Latin Manchu dictionaries. However, Abafi Musen, as a student, for reasons a little too far to get into here, was barred from accessing those because of some scholarly politics in Paris. What he was allowed to access were Chinese Chinese, Tibetan, Mongolian Chinese dictionaries. Not ones into European languages. Those were being guarded by senior folks in Paris that were playing academic politics. But Abel Hamoset could go and take a look at all of these uh, works that have been published by the Qing court to help in their works of translation, literary compilation, uh, and managing their polylingual, polyethnic empire. Right? And this here is Abel Hamoset's handwriting, where he's literally finding, you know, five, six, seven different ways to talk about the Buddha, right? Buddha, right? Sangye, right? Uh, Burhan in Mongolian. Buddha, see, so he's writing it in Tibetan script, but Buddha up there, right? And so on and so forth. Um, cool, right? So this is Abafe Muset literally draw, seeing from Qing sources that there is something that unites those statues, those missionaries we're seeing in Japan, and in Sri Lanka, and in ruins in Pakistan, or in Nepal, and all the Anglo, you know, kind of British uh, Orientalists of the late 18th century, and so on, and finding equivalencies in the world. So with Leibniz's model of racial and hierarchical difference in mind, he's filtering Qing sources and coming up with this notion of Buddhist Asia. Okay. And interestingly, this particular dictionary, which is the one that he was using most, was actually originally composed by Chanke Lopi Dorje, who was a Tibetan uh, monk. Uh, so actually, <laughs> the Tibetans at the beginning and the end. One of these boundary-crossing Ambala monks, right? Which we're going to return to in a moment. So, for his methodological innovation, as much as the content of his many publications, no less than Hegel was a close reader and associate of Abel Moussa. Schopenhauer and Lady later Nietzsche would follow all of their, them gleaning their sort of, of course, wrong, erroneous, nihilist versions of Buddhism from Abel Moussa in his milieu. So this is the philosophy of nothingness, of Nietzsche, right, which is a big 19th uh, century um, movement. The brothers Alexander and Wilhelm von Humboldt, who were then Europe, Europe's best known scientists, um, were exemplary of another kind of Abel Moussa's readers. Um, for many years, for example, Abel Hamoussad and Wilhelm von Humboldt publicly debated the nature of universal grammar, still see in a Leibniz frame. Specifically, if Ch they were debating the question, if Chinese possessed a, a structure, because Abel Hamoussad had, had proved that Chinese had grammar, which actually the Europeans had not thought was true. If Chinese possessed a structure, a grammatical structure that was comparable to German or French or Sanskrit, then did the Chinese possess an analogous system of thought? So this seems kind of ridiculous, but actually this is public debate. This is like the state of the field of uh, public debate in Western Europe in the early 19th century. A kind of moves towards universalism uh, and so on. And so in 1830 Paris, remember we're still here in this movie set, the hall of the Institut de France was so crowded, so full, waiting for Abel Hamoussat to speak. He's so famous, right? And here we go. All right, so here's another thing. Anyways. Okay, so Abel Hamoussat's about to take the dais, right? We're here in Paris. After welcoming his audience and thanking his host, Abel Hamoussat announced 
that his lecture would share preliminary findings from a not yet written book. His topic was the Chinese text as remarkable as it was enigmatic. He had first discovered it in an 18th century Qing imperial compilation which was shelved at the Bibliothèque Royale in Paris. Upon examination, Abelkay Mousset had identified the text as a turn of the 5th century travel account written by uh, 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 a Buddhist renunciate named Fashan. Fashan was a monk of the Eastern Jin Dynasty, I know many of you will be familiar, but let me just quickly introduce him, um, who had been much disturbed by the incomplete state of the Buddhist canon in China. So these are, you know, late 300s, basically, right? Specifically, he was concerned about the scarcity of available translations of the Vinya, or the Buddhist monastic code. Without any sure textu textual firmament, dedicated Chinese monks like Faxian lived their disciplined lives with an uncertain connection to the Buddha's example. The Buddha, by then, had already been dead at least 800 years, right? So, about Rebuset continued, in the year 399, when he was 62 years old, Faxian departed westward from Chang'an in search of Vinaya. Fashan's destination was uh, Tenju, right? Roughly what today we might call India, and what Abel Muset recognized definitively as the wellspring of Buddhism. At the close of the fourth century, India was mostly terra incognita, mostly unknown in Chinese thought and letters, just as it was in the early 19th century for those in France gathered around Abel Muset, Abel Muset's lecture. Following perilous chains of exchange connecting the Ganges River Basin to the lands of the Han, Fashan hoped he could retrieve Vinaya and other scriptures missing from what was then a proto-canon, a not yet complete Chinese canon of Buddhist texts. And he did, famously, completing a precarious passage over the course of 14 years, and along the way studying Sanskrit and collecting, needing, collecting needed records of the Buddhist speech. And upon his return, after some shipwrecks, very famous <laughs> shipwrecks, and kind of eventually finding his way back to China, Faxian wrote an account of his travels, which 14 centuries later, a Manchu imperial court had compiled, and then a French envoy collected, and then Abel Musa had deciphered. And this lecture was to announce the fact that he had identified and had uh, translated and deciphered this account. How remarkable. Albert Rimouset reminded his audience that no scholar in Europe had ever before guessed that Indic languages and traditions had, were known or studied in China, nor that pre-Mohammedan or pre-Islamic Central Asian societies, uh, 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 sorry, the Buddhist societies had existed in pre-Islamic Central Asia. This was all radical, radically new in Europe. Fashan offered, Fashan, through this account, offered an eyewitness account of language and ideas and disciplines of self and community making, moving between Chinese and what they call the Mongolian, Tibetan, and Turkic societies, ringing the Terra Basin, right, the big desert heartlands of what gets called the Silk Road after Richthofen in, in Europe, um, into the valleys and high passes of what we today call Pakistan and Afghanistan, uh, and at that time was still also called Afghanistan and across the thriving, globalized monastic worlds of South Asia. Fashan, furthermore, had come into the presence of monuments marking the time and the place of the historical Buddha, those famous Ashokan pillars, and, and, as well as uh, um, monastic ruins, or you know, all kinds of sites associated with the life of the Buddha, many of which we can still visit uh, today, um, already, who was then already a thousand years dead by Fashan's arrival. When subjected to Abel Rimouset's scientific methods, he's claiming the status of a science, of course, Fashion's ancient walking traced lines around the physical, moral, and metaphysical contours of that great invention of post-Napoleonic Orientalism, Buddhist Asia. And I, this is his language, the physical, the moral, and the metaphysical contours of Buddhist Asia. This is what Fashion's record, when translated and subjected to analysis, was promising a possibility for the project of becoming modern in Europe. This is the language they're using. The audience held their breath. Upon his return to China, um, the Frenchman continued, uh, hurriedly, Fashan was entreated uh, to write his famous account, the Fukuoji. Um, about thing was that had determined that the record had circulated widely uh, in different redactions. There had been Korean and Japanese translations uh, many, many, many centuries ago. 
And untold monk travelers uh, have followed in Fashan's footsteps. Within a century or two, the record uh, we had, you know, had already become a classic in East Asian literature. But not until this May Day in 1830 had any European heard about it or its authors, Eurasian Odyssey, 14 centuries earlier. So hauling primary texts across the epistemic frontiers of the West and non-West, Abelin was said and those in his young science of Buddhist Asia would render, they said, I'm using their language here, would render the fables of Fashan's records into the facts of history. The fluid names and lost monuments uh, Fashan witnessed in South Asia, East, South and Inner and East Asia, were, were going to be ordered into geography. Buddhist moral orders and spheres of intellectual interaction which had been fragmented into dozens of different scripts and traditions, could now be purified into capital P philosophy. This is the project. This is the claim. And I would suggest that we can see quite clearly how much we are heirs to this still, in fact, uh, as a discipline in just in uh, Asian studies in some ways. But I'll come to that moment. Affirming a shared faith in the progressive trajectory of Orientalist knowledge, to loud applause, Abel Hamas had vowed that the young science of Buddhist Asia would soon have his masterwork and leaves the stage. Okay. And see. And it did. Though not before about uh, this luminary of the Orientalist art, Abel Hamouset died in the great cholera pandemic that enveloped Paris in 1832. Uh, two of his colleagues brought it to print. And in 1836, um, uh, the final, the text comes out, the translation. The translation uh, in the published work, the actual translation of the Fogologia of, of Fashan's work takes up 50 pages. There are then 450 pages of footnoting, right? So this was very consciously the staging, an encyclopedic staging of a field of knowledge. This was a consciously field-building, discipline-elevating work, right? It's a field-creating work uh, for um, uh, a kind of a nascent for the studies. And the work, work was an immediate sensation. Within a decade of its publication, however, Abelthe Mousset was already being forgotten. His poached methods were so quickly and universally adopted as to become invisible. His institution building at the Collège de France and the Société, uh, Société Asiatique and the Journal Asiatique were soon disregarded. His pioneering insights were eclipsed and then muted by his successors, many of them his students. And really there's a turn, a sort of triumph of the Anglo-Orientalists who really were um, uh, kind of uh, insisting upon a turn to Pali and Sanskrit sources, the quote unquote primitive or original Buddhism. Where we, we wanted to understand Buddhism, we have to understand what the, you know, the sort of like romantic impulse to origins, and if we can discern, decipher Sanskrit and Pali texts, we'll know what the Buddha meant and what he really meant, and all those sorts of things. It kind of wins out against Abel uh, uh project. And nowadays we find almost no mention of him in the histories of uh, the Asian humanities outside of Sinology uh, and so on. But let me come to my book. I didn't write my book at all to correct the record. The imperfect memory of normative intellectual history really does not concern me, and I was completely not motivated to offer readers some other in the Asian circuit of humanist and social scientific methods into Asia's heartland. Uh, Bantarov was a, si a Siberian loyalist to the, uh, the Russian Tsarist court. Um, and Bantarov was one of the first Asian-Russian subjects to be trained in European scholarly practices, including in ethnology and philology. Like Abakli Muset, who had died a couple decades earlier uh, across, the, across Eurasia, Bantarov was a disciplinary pioneer in his own way. For example, he produced the first ethnology of Siberian shamanism, and in fact, the very concept of shamanism is largely derived from Bantarov's work. It kind of enters into Russian Orientalism and ends up in the first chapter of our world religions textbooks, still to this day. Bantarov actually is doing this. He wrote a book called The Black Faith. It was his PhD dissertation. As part of his SAR-sponsored scholarly trajectory, in the 1850s, Bantarov translated Abel Ben Musset's record. He sorry, sorry, translates Fashan's record um, into Mongolian. And it's called here uh, an account, an account of uh, countries where uh, the Buddhist Dharma flourished. 
This work, which I translated in my book, brought Fashian's 5th century text in the 19th uh, century innovations of Abel Khamasat into the vast republic of Mongolian and later Tibetan letters. But I should say, uh, he's not translating from the Chinese. He's, of course, translating from the French. He doesn't read Chinese. He's not consulting the Chinese text. This is how one. This is the way that Fred, the Abel Khamasat's French translation, this like pinnacle of the science of Buddhist Asia begins circulating out of the epistemic sort of sovereignty claimed by the West at the Orientalist Academy and enters into the Republic of Indonesian Letters to such consequence uh, with Banzarov's initial translation. And this is, I think, one of the first circuits of humanist knowledge from Europe into Mongolia and into that letters, uh, in case anyone's as geeked out about that kind of thing as, <laughs> as I am. Um, but it wasn't a, uh, an arrival, in fact, it was a return. For the Qing polylingual sources of the 18th century, which Abel Khimoset had used, which I've already spoken about, and then erased as he proclaimed a science, right, uh, in, in a sort of Leibnizian frame, uh, were actually derived from dictionaries that had been written by Mongolian and Tibetan polylingual uh, monks working at the Qing court, overseeing these dictionary projects and so on and so forth, as I already said. Now, another major figure in the circuit of uh, the sort of erasure of Europe's first uh, kind of uh, 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 masterpiece in science of Buddhist Asia is Lopsam Damden, Zawa Damden. He was a Halkha Mongolian Buddhist abbot from outer Mongolia, and he was a grand theorist of Qing imperial sovereignty, religion, and politics. I mean, I don't know if these references mean anything, but he's working in the Geluk, which is a sort of shared Tibetan, Mongolian, and at this point, Qing imperial tradition of Buddhism. Um, uh, it was the dominant tradition in Mongolia by the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And he actually becomes an abbot and theorist and historian right as the Qing falls. And he's in the unenviable position of basically interpreting and defending Mongolian Buddhism as uh, the Soviet Union forms and then a Mongolian revolutionary, pro the first in Asia, a revolutionary state, socialist state building project happens in Mongolia. And him and all of his people get shot in the back of the head in 1937. But for 25 years, Zhao Dongdin is using Qing frame models of world historical order to make sense of, and in fact kind of refuse modernist projects like nationalism, um, uh, science, even Orientalism, Buddhology, and all the rest. Anyways, I actually look at that in my, my first book. But um, in 1917, Lopsam Dongdin completed a heavily annotated Tibetan translation, a Banzarov's Mongolian translation, of Abel Khamoset's French translation, of Fashan's Chinese text, right? Also, like Banzarov, Lopsam Dandan did not read Chinese, had no access to the original Chinese text at all. This is just broken telephone back through Paris down to, uh, back to the Qing court of the 18th century. And this, and I translate his version of the Tibetan text in, in my book as well, to the appendix, the sort of Tibetan and Mongolian versions of the Fubuji. About, uh, sorry, Lopsam Dongdin's Tibetan text is called The Emanated Mirror, and in his hands, Abel Khamoset's humanist work is restored and becomes firmly a piece of inner Asian monastic chronicle, heavily annotated with Qing and Tibetan scholastic references, and Fashian's witnessing and journey from so many centuries before here unravels a deep history of inner Asian Buddhism and politics, previously unknown in a millennium of inner Asian monastic historiography. Fashian's text, once it's really pushed through the sieve of like inner Asian Buddhist uh, history and thinking, um, really is a revelation. I mean, the Kala Chakra Tantra is reimagined, the Abhidhamma, uh, all this stuff, right on the eve of like the arrival of revolutionary socialism and nationalism. Fashian's arrival really matters, especially to that writers, a little less so in Mongolian. So, anyways, once I had connected these texts and these disciplinary traditions, uh, and interpretive sites to one another, I was really compelled in this project to think about them together, not in a usual mode of impact or influence, but more in a mode of refusal and silencing. And so here's an example of what Prasanja Dwara, a duke, calls circulatory history, which I develop in a kind of Deleuze and Guattarian frame of uncentered becoming of knowledge that defies the universal and which rejects civilizational narratives and exclusivist forms of epistemic sovereignty. 
And so the work of this book, I mean, what I was aiming for, uh, I came to realize was to illuminate that raw plane of combination, connection, and exchange that made and unmade the disciplinary practice of Buddhist, Buddhist and Asian studies, while also, um, but also Qing inflected global historical orders and the time and place of Mongolian and Tibetan experiences, monastic experiences of modernist violence uh, and exile. Okay, so let me just give you a few examples of what shows up in the Inner Asian text and then I'll, I'll conclude. Um, okay, yeah, so to that end, um, the bulk of my book isn't really focused so much on the narrative, uh, the narrative of the record of Fascio's text in the French, the Mongolian, and the Tibetan, um, but instead on the extensive footnoting and annotation which accompanies each of these works, both in the French and in the Mongolian and the Tibetan. In the Eurasian circulation um, of erasure and writing that I explore, here, shared topics of, ex of concern emerge unexpectedly in the sort of scholarly asides that accompany every sentence, every paragraph, basically, in, in many cases. So, Bethlehem was set as much as this Hakka Mongolian monk, nearly a century later, both asked, what was the nature of Fashan as a person? Was he enlightened? Was he human? Um, the French, for example, really dwell extensively on the humanness of Fashan. He cries when his companion dies in the mountains, right? He sees a Chinese fan in Sri Lanka and tears come down his face because he's reminded of home, right? Um, in the inner Asian sources, those passages, even though they're reading the French, they are, they're erased entirely. Fasha becomes a bodhisattva, basically the equivalent of an, an enlightened being performing the drama of the human on the, uh, in the human stage like a Dalai Lama or incarnate figure. Um, kind of unaffected by samsara, right? And sort of playing the role of a monk in order to connect India and China together. Why did Fashan walk westward from Chang'an? What was the historical significance of the city-state of Khotan and other Silk Road city-states? What was the identity and influence of ancient Xiongnu nomads, Yueshi people, and so on? And how could the opaque references in Fashan's record be correctly interpreted by appeal to later Chinese travelogues like that of Shuangsang and Yijing and so on. What was the scale of space and distance of Fashian's walking around Eurasia in relation to the place, their places of their interpretation? Paris, Lhasa, uh, uh, outer, you know, the Ikhre and other Mongolia and so on. And what measure of time could exactly date the Buddha's life and death? All of these very disparate interpreters of fashion and ask these questions while being completely unaware of each other, actually. And yet their interpretations ever entangled, like centerless kind of mesh, worked to, uh, worked to wildly different interpretive ends. What helped reproduce the West non-West non -West binary in the Collège de France was used to extend the cosmological order of the Kalachakotantra in the Tibetan diaspora. What could be explained to affirm racial hierarchies of non-Western difference in, the, uh, in Paris was used to claim a deep historical transmission of the Buddhachana among ancient Mongols, Tibetans, and, and Siberians who Fashian had supposedly witnessed. This is some of the creative work of the inner Asian interpreters of, uh, of this text. All was the tangled ma uh, uh, mass of um, uh, this circulatory history, wherein humanism and its contiguous traditions were made and unmade in relationship to one another. Um, kind of an example of what was made in relationship to Hegel, but I'm going to skip that. And I, if anyone's interested, I can, I can talk about that question. I don't know. Sorry, no, my, my partner likes Hegel. So oh. I'm <laughs> obsessed with that. I don't hear that all the time. <laughs> so it was a happy sigh. <laughs> it, was, it was good, though. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, okay. I could talk at length, and there's a couple of chapters devoted to what is made in the context of the European Academy out of it, and, but the main one, of course, is the very notion of East Asia. But let's talk about Inner Asia, actually. Let's leave the, the European Academy behind. Um, and let's go to the last interpretive site that I examine in my book, um, which is the Tibetan refugee camps of the 1960s. 
Um, those Tibetans staggering across the Himalaya in the 1950s uh, in light of the annexation of Tibet by the, uh, by the PRC, of course, were not only Tibetans, um, but also those who had suffered a double or even triple exodus. Buryats and Kalmyks who had escaped Soviet, Soviet erasure in the 1910s, and Mongols who had avoided the net of socialist show trials and firing squads in the 1920s and 1930s. One of them, who I think I have a slide up, yeah, was Nawanima, a leading Geluk Buddhist, that was a tradition of Indonesian Buddhism, Geluk abbot and scholar in the early Tibetan settlements. And in the 1970s, the Dalai Lama actually sent him to be a professor in Leiden in the Netherlands, interestingly. Um, Nawanima was the first monastic historian to turn to traditional genres of monastic history writing, so like Lokyu, Chujurum, for anyone who's familiar with Tibetan literature, Gyanrap, to answer pressing, pressing questions in the, in the refugee diaspora. So he's kind of the first guy to write monastic history in the refugee settlements um, in, um, in India. And basically his question was, what time, how to time or historicize the violence of the Tibetan 20th century? How did displaced ethnic and linguistic groups from Siberia, Mongolia, and Tibetan societies emplace their loss in relationship to one another? What regimes of historicity governed their dizzy present in the 1960s? And while posted as a teacher at Sanskrit University of Varanasi in 1960, he answered these questions, Nima, in a text called The Lamp of Scripture and Reasoning, which is the Chujung Lumi Fiume uh, in Tibetan. And what is fascinating is that now Ma Nima approaches these questions from a particular Geluk interpretive tradition, one that's really tied to the Qing and all kinds of border crossing, kind of uh, polylingual uh, uh, monastic scholarship. But unexpectedly, in this first monastic history written in the refugee uh, settlements, the usual litany of enlightened Buddhist kings and Hans. Manchu emperors, Ashoka, luminary Tibetan and Mongolian monks, you know, Indian citizens, and so on, are reframed. The refugee experience of socialist state violence and refugee diaspora among Inter-Asian communi Inter communities is instead set into time by appeal to a wandering 5th century monk named Fashan. So, for example, these are the opening lines of the first monastic history. What's more, the route through which Indian Panditas and Siddhas, Chinese monks and so on, journeyed to and fro while composing scriptures, passed through Khotan, part of the territory of the Uyghur Mongols. The travel guide, and by this, he's, this is the, he's talking about the Fogoji, the record of uh, uh, Fashan's record, um, reports that during Fashan's journey to the land of noble ones, which is India, uh, Pakyu, more than 200 years before Shuanzang, the Dharma traditions he witnessed in Upper Soh, he means Tokhara, kind of uh, Khotan and so on, followed Indian traditions and so on and so forth. This is unparalleled in any Buddhist history written in Tibetan or Mongolian letters prior to this, this one, right? And this is the fascinating kind of endpoint of this circulation that my book is follows. Not only the, um, by the time that Mao and Ima and these Tibetans were arriving in the refugee camps, Fashian had already been made to tell Tibetan and Mongolian stories. In the Tibet, in Mongolian and Tibetan uh, editions of the text, and I'll give a couple examples in a moment, Fashian had, was reimagined to have witnessed a uh, collective kind of Inner Asian uh, experience, uh, quite unlike the original Chinese or French uh, claim. So, um, so because of time, let me just give a few examples of why someone like Nao and Nima were right, would write to other Tibetan refugees and sort of console them and give them context for their refugee erasure and, and diaspora by appeal to fascia, and not by appeal to Tibetan monks or kings or, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, oh yeah. Okay. So in the Mongolian, which is being made out of the French, right, playing off of a footnote about desert passage in India from Abel Ben Musset. Um, uh, Banzarov has Fashan, for example, being patronized not by foreign kings as he walks through Central Asia on his way to, to, to India, as we read in the Chinese, but by Uyghur and Mongolian kings along his fraught desert passage to India. Along the way in the Tibetan, we have Fashan passing by 
well, a well-known pilgrimage center for Tibetan Buddhists, Anhyamachan, a very famous pilgrimage mountain. All across India, in Mongolian and Tibetan versions of the text, Fashan no longer encounters non-Buddhist devotees of India's many, many gods, but Bun practitioners. Bun is a sort of like mirror, kind of quote-unquote non-Buddhist tradition, although it's kind of framed in the image of Buddhism in, 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 in Tibet. The Buddha's enlightenment and Parinirvana are explained confidently according to Geluk scholastic positions, philosophical positions, about conventional truth and inferential cognition, uh, and so on. So with this ancient Chinese witness to a Tibetan and Mongolian history as wide as Eurasia itself, Lopsam Dandan's Tibetan language interpretation especially proposed radical new visions of the early spread of the Dharma into Inner Asia. For example, the Cotonese monks at the court of San San Gampo, you know, this like early Tibetan Empire stuff, um, could now be considered Mongol because of Fashian's uh, 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 age of walking. The many Central Asian figures involved in the lives of Chisong Densen, another early Buddhist king, Padmasambhava, and so on, are now Mongol. By means of Fashian, Lopsan Dandan extends uh, Qing era historical maneuvers and claims that not only had Mongol Shonu and ancient Central Asian peoples kind of identified as Mongol, uh, uh, that it was claimed had brought the Dharma to China, uh, but now Mongol, Mongol Cotonese, Turks, Sogdians, and even Persians could be considered to have brought the Dharma to Tibet. And, and there's so much to say here. There's chapters devoted to this in the book. I just, I'll, I'll get to it in questions if anyone's interested. But basically, the text is remained such that in the refugee diaspora, it's Fashion, not any more familiar figure from Tibetan or Mongolian history or even Indian Buddhist history, that helps set the time of the refugee experience uh, into history. Okay, so let me conclude. Over the course of, reading, of uh, researching and writing this book, um, I came to think about this, uh, this kind of circulatory history, one that includes but also exceeds our disciplinary past in a, in a Buddhist studies or Asian studies context as a kind of anti-field history of Buddhist and Asian studies. Anti-field history, for me, or what I'm interested in exploring, resists linearity, it resists privileging impact and influence and diffusion in favor of processes of erasure, of silence, and of dissonance. Anti-field history is not focused on field creation, but on field disintegration. Thinking against field history in this way is full, I think, of disciplinary possibility for us today. To repurpose uh, C.J. Hartman's phrasing, the result is, quote, to illuminate the contested character of history, narrative, event, and fact to topple the hierarchy of discourse, and to engulf authorized speech in a clash of voices, end quote. And to do so, of course, is also to implicate ourselves, the sites of our interpretation, the erasures that are already always the requirement of our own scholarly speech into the story. And so by this experiment, um, I hope that more scholars of inter-Asian history and Buddhist studies and Asian humanities generally might begin to imagine a part of their disciplinary identity the requirement to have answers to Kuan Sin Chen's vital de-imperializing and decolonizing question. Why is Asia, or Buddhist Asia, I would say, always an object, but never a generative condition for theory and methodological innovation in the humanities? Why is Asia always an object, never a generative condition for theory and methodological innovation in the humanities? How might our choices, especially taken in a wide field of uh, in a wide field of interaction and erasure, challenge the modern project itself as it constitutes subjects, knowledge, and power as subjects to the epistemic sovereignty of the placeless West? This is a kind of epistemic delinking that our colleagues in Latin American studies, indigenous studies, black study, feminist, queer studies, and so on are already engaged in. Um, it engages in a kind of epistemic delinking and disobedience that Wael Halak and Walter Mignolo, in their own very different contexts, among many others, insist is the work ahead for us in the renewal of the humanities. And some good answers, or at least starting places for answers, I think, are to be found in the kinds of circulatory histories of the making, but also the unmaking of our disciplinary practice. The sort of porous brown boundaries of the humanities and those traditions from which it draws kind of collapsing clear distinctions between primary and secondary sources and so on, um, in which this Eurasian story of Fashan's record is just one example. There are hundreds, thousands more that we could look at. 
So thank you very much.